On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, we may have the world's largest detour as the Panama Canal restricts the number of vessels allowed to go through it. I am your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So back in March of 2021, we started this channel because of a ship going sideways in it. And we started with what's going on in the Suez. Well, today it's what's going on in the Panama Canal. Because of low water levels up on Gatun Lake, we are seeing the potential for the reduction in the number of vessels that are going to be allowed to go through the canal. This has global impact on the economy because of the number of ships that have to go through there and what those ships carry. We're going to look at that today, examine the story. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come in. So this is the story over on FreightWaves. Greg Miller, shipping braces for impact as Panama Canal slashes capacity. Container ships could block most LNG, LPG carriers from the larger locks. All right, why are we seeing this happen? Because of low water levels up on Gatun Lake, there is, not, there is insufficient water to drain from the lake to operate the canal. And this is causing not just a reduction in the number of ships going through, but also the carrying capacity of the larger ships in what's called the Neo Panamax lane. This is the lane of the Panama Canal that was added in 2016. There are three lanes to the canal. The two original ones opened in 1914. The newest lane opened in 2016. So what does this mean? Well, Panama Canal is the greatest shortcut ever built in the history of the world. It is fantastic. Uh, nearly 3% of the global maritime trade goes through the Panama Canal, but understand the biggest user of the Panama Canal is the United States. The U.S. built that canal, started way back in the early 1900s. Under Teddy Roosevelt, uh, we arranged to have Panama break away from Colombia when Colombia wanted more money for it. We basically fostered a revolution. We have controlled the Panama Canal up until 1999 under an agreement brokered by President Carter in 1979. The decision was made to turn the Panamanian Canal back over to the Panamanians, a strange thing. Uh, we decided to do it. Uh, it was done in 1999. And since then, the Panama Canal has been absolutely essential from its creation until today of moving American commerce. It's been involved in economics. It's been involved in military uh, movement of vessels. Everything can go through the Panama Canal from the U.S. Navy except the largest aircraft carriers. So really essential that the Panama Canal be in operation. Right now, what we're seeing is ships piling up at the canal, waiting to get through. But the most important thing is the wait time. We're seeing extended wait times. You're talking about five to six days to transit from the Atlantic side to the Pacific side, uh, what's called the, uh, uh, the southbound lane, excuse me, from the northbound lane, from the, the Pacific side to the Atlantic side. It's not really the Pacific to the Atlantic side. It's the Gulf of Panama to the Caribbean Sea. But it's taken five to six days to go northbound in the canal to the Atlantic, uh, coming southbound for uh, the largest vessels, it's three to four days. And that's a problem because we're gonna see vessels piled up off the canal. This is the chart included in Greg Miller's story, and it starkly demonstrates what we're talking about here in reductions. Panama Canal usually handles about 35 ships a day. It's down to 32 ships a day right now about 10 going through the Neo Panamax locks and about 11 using each of the twin Panamax locks for a total of 32. But by January 1st, if there's not a preachable increase in rain, you're going to see that cut by over a third, 15 ships in the Panamax locks and five in the Neo Panamax locks. And it could go down even further. This is a breakdown of transits by ships for 2022 and 2023. The red shows you those vessels that use the Neo Panamax lane. And notice it is container ships are the biggest users, so between four to five uh, every day. And Neo Panamax container ships are large. Uh, prior to the opening of the 2016 canal locks, the biggest container ship that can go through is about 4,500 boxes. You're talking about 16,000 box ships now that can use it. And that's one of the biggest groups of ships that are being built to replace the old container ships because of the profits made by the container lines during the supply chain crisis. But notice the second group are LPG, liquefied petroleum gas carriers, and LNG, liquefied natural gas carriers. LPG and LNG carriers come from the Gulf of Mexico, go through the Panama Canal, and head to Asia. They provide vital, vital fuel for South Korea, for Japan, and for China. 
if they cannot use that Neo Panamax lane, then they have to go another route. And that is absolutely essential. Neo Panamax container ships can offload part of their con containers. They can send those containers ashore in LA and Long Beach, which we see those numbers on a rise right now. They can use the west coast of Mexico and use the rail line system that has now been developed to get into the United States. They can go to Oakland, Seattle, Tacoma. There are alternatives to that. They can even offload in the Panama and rail the containers across if necessary. But liquefied petroleum and liquefied natural gas have got to go in those carriers. And I actually think that is the major issue here that's stemming or we're going to see stem happen. This is the Panama Canal. Hey, marine traffic has changed their platform a new view i love it it's great I, I haven't had a chance to really go into it in a lot of uh ways but uh, marine traffic is always a great that's my go-to source i use for ais you'll see the ships piled up here these are the ships in the gulf of panama waiting to go north uh from the gulf of panama up into the caribbean from the pacific to the atlantic we're going to look on the atlantic side here for a minute because i want to take a look at the lock system so i talked about a sets of locks there is the old locks here on the left these are the original locks. Uh, and when you come from the Atlantic side, you're gonna come through these trio of locks into it. If you use the Neo Panamax, this is the Neo Panamax, the really big lane that you see right here. And understand the reason that the low lake level is causing problems is because you're reducing the amount of water on Gatun Lake. So Panama Canal is fueled by Gatun Lake, this massive freshwater lake here in the very Northern part of Panama. There are dams that hold that water back. The locks hold the water back. But the way the system works is when you come into the Panama Canal here, and I'll show you a uh, ship getting ready to come into the canal here. This is the, uh, was it? The Cost Lucky is getting ready to come into the canal. It's going to come in the first lock here. And you see there's a series of locks that are being used here. It'll come into the first lock. When you come into a lock to come up, the across the canal you come up about 85 feet but you don't you're not lifted in one lock it's a set of three locks you got to go through three locks and get lifted up so when you go through the three locks the very first lock you come into has salt water in it you sail into it you come in with ocean water and you sit in the lock they will open the uh, uh, valves there's no pumps you use gravity to feed water from gatun lake into that lock that first lock will rush water in to the front of the lock and kind of push out the salt water and then they'll eventually shut the gate and they'll raise you up and then you go to the next gate and you see a vessel here in the second gate right now this is the hyphna cn it will then be flooded with fresh water and come up and same thing when you go to the third lock and eventually you're 85 feet above sea level and you can sail across gatun lake when you come back out as this vessel is doing here's the cultist cove outbound when you get into the lock, they'll take the water level from that lock and open a valve and dump it into the ocean. You, and then when you go to the next lock to go down, they'll dump that into the ocean. And the next lock, they'll dump that into the ocean. For almost every ship voyage you go through, you spend or you lose about 50 million gallons of the lake. It's spilled out. And so that fresh water spills out. You can't use salt water because this is a freshwater lake. This is a lake that provides drinking water for Panama. It maintains a habitat. You can't just flood this with salt water. You'll kill everything in and around the area and you won't be able to give water to the people of Panama. When you look at the Neo Panamax lane, I'm gonna show you the Neo Panamax lane, you'll notice these uh, trio of pools right here. That's because they developed a water reclamation system. When you, instead of pumping that fresh water back out into the ocean, they pump it into these reservoirs and these reservoirs are used to fill the water back up again. So you, you save about 60% of the water. You lose a lot through, during evaporation. And when you eventually open the bottom lock, you're going to lose that water because it's contaminated, but you basically preserve 60%. These exist only for the Neo Panamax lane. They don't have them for the old lane. So every time you move a ship through, you lose about 50 million gallons of water, 60% as much when you do the Neo Panamax lane. And this is one of the reasons why we're seeing reductions. Now, Panama should, and hopefully they have plans to put some water reclamation systems in for the older lanes, but right now that's not helping them. And this is why there's a big situation and why they're talking about reducing the number of transits through, because every time they open the locks, they, they're, they're spilling Gatun Lake out. 
Here's an example of water usage for physical year 2022. You'll see that the, Panama, uh, the Panamax locks use 28.6% of total water usage. So they, they look at Gatun Lake, they look at how much water is lost from the lake every year versus what's reclaimed back in. And 28.6 of that goes out that way. 6.6% due to evaporation, 2.3 for concessions, 1.8 uh, because of just discharges through dams and, and, and other water areas. 22.5% for hydro uh, uh, generation. They, they have dams to, to generate power. 9% for drinking water. And the biggest use is the Neo Panamax lanes. If you add up the, the, the Panama Canal, over 50% of the water is being used out of Gatun Lake by it. And the Neo Panamax lanes, which is the largest lanes, but still reclaim 60% of it, is still the biggest user because of the sheer volume of those locks. They're tremendous in size. So you're just spilling massive amounts of water out of Gatun Lake. This is the water level in the Panama Canal right now. Basically going to be looking at about 79 point, uh, excuse me, for November 2nd, 79.7 feet of water. Uh, so really low levels. They're hoping to see some water rise here and potentially get it back up to 81 feet. You see the restrictions on draft right here, 44 feet for Neo Panamax. But hold this number in your head, 79.7 feet for the beginning of November. If you come back down here to the historical where it should be, it should be at 86.7 feet. October should be at 86 feet. We should be seeing the Panama Canal coming from its drought, lowest level of May, and increasing during this period of time. It's not. I know Panama Canal pilots. It's not raining there. And this is what's causing the big problem. They're just not seeing that water level rise. Well, if the Panama Canal doesn't get rain, you're going to see over a one-third reduction by January of the number of vessels coming in. That means vessels are going to have to divert. They're going to have to go in other directions. If you're coming from the Gulf of Mexico here, you cannot use the Panama Canal because of the low levels. You, you, maybe you can't get booked or you're not going to have enough time to get there. So if you're a liquefied natural gas or liquefied petroleum gas carrier, you're going to have to sail from the Gulf of Mexico head out into the Atlantic and probably go across through the Straits of Gibraltar into the Mediterranean Sea and have to transit through the Suez Canal, the Bab el, the Red Sea, the Bab el Mandab, and then out into this area. We already know, just did a video on this not too long ago, talking about three warnings put out by the Maritime Administration. One's in the Persian Gulf area, one's in the Black Sea, and the other encompasses the Eastern Med, the Red uh, Suez Canal, Red Sea, Bab el Mandab, and the Gulf of Aden. This is because of what's going on between Israel and Hamas, missile launches out of Yemen toward this area. This is a highly volatile area. And now all of a sudden, we're going to be funneling more ships into this. Can ships go other routes? Yeah, they can sail out of the Gulf of Mexico and go the long route around the southern tip of South, of, of, excuse me, of South Africa. That's a really long route. It's a really long route, adds lots of time to it. And that means you're not going to be able to do as many voyages. Very unlikely ships are going to head down here to the very southern tip of South America. That's a really dangerous route. I, probably not that recommended. But what you're seeing here, and I just put on cargo ships and uh, the green ones and red there for tankers. You're seeing how that disruption could have impact. If you lose the Panama Canal and even a reduction of one third, that's going to have a major impact. It's going to have a major impact on you as the consumer, as the energy consumer, as a shipper wanting to get your goods from point A to point B. Uh, it causes disruptions. If all of a sudden now ships have to go longer distances, uh, that means ships are less productive. If you want to get your containers and you can't get them through this Panama Canal to Houston, to Savannah, to New York, New Jersey, then you're going to have to go into LA and Long Beach. And let's be clear, while LA and Long Beach don't have the delays they had during the supply chain crisis, the fundamental issues are still there. Uh, you're going to have excess cargo being landed into LA and Long Beach. You're going to have to get out of LA and Long Beach to the Inland Empire in Ontario, to the warehouses. You're going to have to use Class 1 rail. You're going to have to use road traffic, trucks. Well, we're seeing right now the, the, the freight recession take place with overcapacity in, in trucks right now leading to the collapse of companies like Yellow and Convoy. We're seeing class one railway issues. This has global implica implications. I don't think enough people are talking about Panama.
Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? You can hit the super thanks button down below, or you can head over to Patreon and become a monthly or yearly subscriber. Or if you want, get a gallon of fresh water, head to Panama, fill up Gatun Lake. Maybe that would alleviate the problem. New videos coming out very shortly on my trip to the National Defense Transportation Association Transcom fall meeting. Uh, you'll see the panel that I was on, got the video just sent to me, so working on that. Also, a response video to Peter Zion's most recent video about the Jones Act. Till our next episode, this is Sal, signing off.